thumbs up when you're ready. Um, Ashley, could you put the open that door a little bit and put a brick by it just uh, to get some fresh air in here? It's kind of warm. I think it's already streaming. You'll just have to hit record and then um, hit go live on everything. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Glad to have you with us this morning. Glad to have all the people that are going to be tuning in through the live stream with us. Um, appreciate you listening and tuning in. Um, I was going to continue on my lessons on the Judgment Seat of Christ pop quiz and get in some things regarding the family. Um, actually, last week, uh, Judah, my son, 10-year-old, came up and was kind of concerned, you know, about the Judgment Seat of Christ, wondering if Jesus was going to ask him questions, you know, like that at the Judgment Seat of Christ. And I got thinking about that. I was like, well, I mean, every one of us shall appear before the Judgment Seat of Christ. If a child is saved, I mean, the Lord will probably I don't see any reason biblically why the Lord wouldn't bring that child up, you know, and say, hey, did you obey your parents? You know, did you do the things I told you to do? You know, things like that. It's kind of an interesting thought. I got to thinking about that. But anyway, uh, preparing for a lesson this week, nothing really came to mind. It just was one of those things where it wasn't really flowing, putting together a lesson on the next aspect of the Judgment Seat of Christ pop quiz. And um, but this did come to mind. And this is something that God has given me recently that I'm going to teach on today. So it's a completely different subject than what we went over last week. And it actually works out because uh, my two oldest boys are with my grandma or my mom, their grandma right now. And they wouldn't be here to listen to that lesson anyway. So I think that's why the Lord did that. But go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis 1 verse 1. I was thinking the other day, you know, our church is small. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles and programs, you know, that come with uh, some of the bigger churches. But you know what? Every time I come here on Sundays, I'm always getting something. You know, it's like I, I know at least I'm going to come here. I'm going to get fed. You're going to get something. We're like a little food cart. You know, sometimes the food carts have the best meals. They're not big. They're not like the big restaurants, but sometimes they got some pretty good stuff. <laughs> and so I, I hope this little church is like a food cart for a lot of people, especially the people that tune in online that maybe not have a church they can go to or a Bible-believing church in their area. They can just come and tune in, whether YouTube or Facebook or Final Fight, and uh, get some kind of delicious meal that you're not going to find anywhere else, you know. Um, anyway, so Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning God created... The heaven and the earth. Before we get going, let's pray. God, I come before you this morning, and I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for giving us the scriptures. I believe this book. We believe it all. Everyone here believes this word is this book is your word. We believe it by faith, and Lord, we uh, believe it's perfect. We don't think that we're smarter than your Bible. We don't uh, think we can correct it with some ancient language that we don't speak. Father, uh, we yield ourselves to you, and we just ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to the people, the, the ears and the hearts that will be hearing the lesson today. And I pray you would be glorified in it, and your book would be understood. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And this is an infinitely complex universe that we lived in, but it's the entire universe that we live in today is summed up in these 10 words right here, and I find that amazing. You don't have to be a genius to understand how everything began and where everything came from. I mean, my youngest child is five years old, and they understand how the universe began. It's very simple. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, you'd have to have a college education to be dumb enough to reject the statement, in ex to reject this simple statement in Genesis 1-1 for the statement of something along the lines of, in the beginning, nothing accidentally blew up and over billions of years evolved into everything. It takes a college education to be that stupid. And uh, as Bible believers, we know what happens next because we have verse 2. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So uh, a destruction takes place that's not explained here in this passage. But as you read throughout the Bible, you find clues as to what happened. And uh, this destruction here in verse 2 correlates with the fall of Lucifer. And Lucifer, is, you know, as you know, we've taught in the past, is the fifth cherub who became lifted up in pride and subsequently was cast down out of heaven. And uh, this is called the gap theory, as they say, but it might as well be a gap fact, uh, because this is the only hypothesis to date, okay, that explains why God's creation is full of disorder and chaos in verse 2. 
There is no other theory that explains this adequately. There is no other theory besides the gap theory, if you want to call it that, that explains what Ezekiel 28 is even talking about in regards to the fallen cherub. And uh, it's the only hypothesis that explains where the evil serpent in the garden came from, right? If you reject the gap theory, where did that evil serpent come from? What, where, how did he just show up in the garden and is tempting Adam and Eve? That's weird. And it explains also why the serpent's evil. So after Genesis 1-2, you have uh, what is generally called the creation account in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, however, in all actuality, it's actually the recreation account, Genesis, the rest of Genesis chapter 1. After Genesis 1-2, uh, God recreates things. And it says in verse 3, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Okay, so day one of the recreation involves the creation of light and division from darkness. All right, so we won't read through the rest of Genesis chapter one. Uh, you're probably pretty familiar with it, but what you have is essentially this. And I'm just going to write down some general terms that go along with the seven days of creation, as we call it. I'll call it the seven days of creation. It's actually the seven days of recreation. I'll probably use those terms interchangeably. Uh, don't uh, kill me over this, the semantics of the technicalities of the terms. Because you could even say it's actually a remaking of the earth, not necessarily a recreating, because there's a difference between created, formed, and made. But day chapter J1, you have uh, light, okay? So you have light and division from darkness and things like that. Day number two, you remember that it uh, has to do with the waters. Remember? The waters and the firmament or what we would call outer space, firmament, okay? And if you're not familiar with this, you can read it after the lesson today, Genesis chapter 1, some pretty amazing stuff in here. Day number 3, who remembers day number 3? Yep, you have the dry ground, and uh, you have the, the plants, right? And uh, day number 4, who remembers that? Sun, moon, and stars, right? Sun, moon, stars. Day number five is what? Birds. Yep, animals. <laughs> animals, birds, all that stuff. Day number six. Day number six, anybody? Man, yep. Man, Adam and Eve. And then uh, day number seven is that day of rest all right so i'm giving a i'm setting this foundation here for the rest of this lesson so we can kind of remember those things without having, without having to necessarily go back over it but uh, what i'm going to show you today is a uh, strange phenomenon that i've noticed in the bible over over the years of reading the bible studying the bible uh, I, there's a weird phenomenon that happens and god has an interesting way of doing something and then he repeats it backwards it's kind of weird. Um, think of it kind of like a man climbing a mountain. I need some different colors here. All right. No, I don't want that color. All right. So think of it like, uh, you know, you got a man climbing a mountain. All right. As you climb a mountain and you're, you're, you start at the bottom and you ascend to the top. Okay. We're going to say that the bottom is level one and the top is level uh, seven. I'm going to make this number seven, and the bottom is uh, number one. Okay, so you're climbing up from the bottom to uh, level seven, and to continue going forward once he's reached the top, he now has to descend and start going back down the mountain, and the descending levels go in the same order that he ascended with. So you have number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, and then it, to continue moving forward, you're going to go back down in the same order, right? Number six, number five, number four, but look at what's happening. You're going forward, but you're going in reverse as far as the numbers go. Number two, number one, all right? So it's kind of like climbing a mountain. This, I, I'm likening climbing a mountain to the way that God, this phenomenon in the Bible, how God will do a thing and then it will reach a zenith, and then he'll repeat the thing in reverse. 
It's really interesting, and I'm going to show it to you. Now, God is the author of history, and it appears to me that He has designed history like this, traveling up and down a mountain. And so what I'm going to, go, what I'm going to teach you today uh, came to me while I was actually driving to church a couple of weeks ago, and I was thinking about all this uh, craziness going on in the country. Obviously, if you've seen anything in the news, if you don't, if you have a if you uh, don't live under a rock, you realize that there's some crazy things going on in the country. And as I've said before, I'm more personally more interested in what God is doing than in what is actually you know, going on. I mean, there's a lot of things going on, but I want to know, what is God doing here? I like to stay informed, but not just for the sake of being informed. I want to stay informed because I want to receive instruction from God. I want to know what's going on, so hopefully I can recognize what God is doing. Right? That, that's why I try to stay up to date with the things that are going on, because I, I want to know what God is doing. God is operating in the present, but if I don't even know what's going on in the present, how am I really going to know what God is doing. So that's kind of the way I look at it. The thought then struck me that, uh, you know what? What are we seeing today? We are seeing a global division on a magnitude that really has, is unparalleled in the history of the world, except maybe the Tower of Babel. You could, you could say that was a pretty big division. <laughs> but uh, the division that we have today in modern history that's going on in the world, not just in America, but worldwide, is unparalleled. We'll, we're seeing increasing division and growing animosity in nearly every facet of society and the world around us. We see old versus young. We see male versus female. These things are being separated. They're being divided. We see white versus black. We see conservative versus liberal. We see healthy versus sick. We see patriot versus globalist. And before everybody, there's always these groups, but they're all kind of mingled together. Whereas now, it's like everything is being separated, 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 and these groups are starting to clash with each other more and more. We see rich versus poor. We see straight versus gay. We see religious, and it's not gay, it's homosexual, well, it's not even, it's sodomite, sodomite. We see straight versus sodomites, religious versus uh, sacrilegious. And uh, pick any facet of society you want, it is being divided, divided, divided. And so it occurred to me, I wonder if this is what God is doing in the world today. Is God dividing things? Is this why everything is being divided? We would liken it to a divide and conquer, or we would generally attribute it to a globalist divide and conquer strategy, get everybody class warfare and fighting with each other so that they can come and take it over, and I'm sure that's a part of it. But God is allowing all this to happen, and what if it is God that is dividing everything and everyone? And it wouldn't be unlike the Lord to do this. I mean, think about it. God's been a divider ever since creation. The first day of creation involved division, right? God divided the nations at the Tower of Babel. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, Think not that I'm come to come bring peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am not, I am come, not a physical... Not a physical sword, not like Allah, not like Mohammed with a physical sword coming to chop to people. That's not what Jesus was saying. He said, I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Because in a lot of cultures especially, you convert to Christianity, your family hates you. And so Jesus, so if you go with Jesus, it's going to create division. The Word of God is like a sword that divides the soul and spirit from the flesh, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So God has been in the business of dividing things for a very long time. Now, the entire global world system right now is reaching its point of uh, maximum instability as we approach the time of Satan's final kingdom. And you think about it, the great empires of the earth are summarized in the idol or the image there in Daniel chapter 2. And the empire, the last empire, is likened to feet, right, mixed with iron and clay. Now, if you are going to build something, especially with these heavy elements of gold and silver and brass and iron, your foundation, you don't want to make it with this intermingled iron and clay mix. That's a horrible foundation. That's a very unstable element right there for the final kingdom. It's very unstable. And that last kingdom won't last longer than probably 10 years. That final kingdom of the feet. 
And as we get cl closer to the time of those feet, I've taught in the past, we're around the, the ankles, <laughs> around the iron, at the end of the iron kingdom. But as we get closer to the time of those feet, we're going to see more and more instability. And as I've said before, I do think that there will be a window of great prosperity kind of like the calm before the storm of the Great Tribulation. I think we will see that great prosperity, but it will be a deceptive prosperity that will end in total destruction. But uh, nevertheless, the idea of God dividing everything, or perhaps allowing Satan to divide everything, is interesting to me. Look at Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Like I said, this, this lesson today, it's, it's a Bible study, but it also, the purpose of this Bible study is I want you to see, I think... I've identified where we're at right now in history. And, you know, there's a lot of different things we could point to, but this is just some particular facet that I think the Lord has shown me. Because I've asked the Lord a lot, what are you doing? <laughs> what is it that's going on? I want to know what God is doing today in the world. There's all this craziness going on. It could go in so many different directions. What is God doing? I understand that He's getting things ready for the tribulation and some of those general things. But I want to know... I, I want to really see the hand of God and what in what He's doing with all this, and by understanding what God is doing, be able to anticipate what He's going to do next. All right. So Mark chapter three and look at verse twenty-four. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. That's a good thing to remember for our country. If our country is divided against itself, that country can't stand. It, it can't stand for long. It will fall eventually if this thing doesn't, because we're seeing a lot of division right now. But uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of division in, the, in our own kingdom, if you will. But uh, the current global system is divided. Why? It's going to fall. It's going to fall to Satan, the Antichrist. The whole thing is divided, so it can fall, and Satan can re, re, the Antichrist can rebuild it in his new world order. But then after that, his global kingdom will fall to Jesus shortly thereafter. So if I had to guess, I think we're in a time of great division, and we're only going to see more and more division until the time of the rapture, which is the ultimate division, if you will. And so hold that thought for a second, and we're going to get back to this mountain now. Okay, so hold that thought. If you had to guess what is the peak or the zenith of world history, what would you suspect it would be? The cross. The cross, exactly. I mean, after all, that's where uh, time is based off of AC and BC, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, BC, before Christ. So I'd, I'd put that at the the zenith, the top of history, okay? And I, as I mentioned, it goes in reverse after the zenith. So I'd put Calvary at the top on uh, the number seven there. And Calvary was the bringing of spiritual rest to God's creation, right? Okay, Jesus' last words on the cross were, it is finished, right? And he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Salvation is not of works, right? It's the opposite. It's rest. It's resting your faith in Jesus Christ. A type of it is given in Hebrews 4.10 where it says, For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Okay, so that has some tribulation ap application, but type uh, typologically that refers to us. We've ceased from our own works. By what? By trusting in Jesus Christ and what He did. So I'm going to put Calvary at the top of the mountain, and I'm going to start there. And that is level 7, if you will. And I'm going to say that this corresponds to day number 7 of creation. Okay? Rest. Okay? Day number 7. What would follow then would be day number 6. Okay? And day number six was the day that related to man, right, as far as creation goes. Now, I'm going to start at the top, and I'm going to go down this way. So we're going to go actually backwards, and you're going to see what, where I'm going with all this here in just a minute. But uh, what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start pointing out some interesting parallels throughout mankind's history that seems to parallel the seven days of creation. I find this really interesting. Day six was the creation of man. All right, so let's take history. Right after Calvary, what do we have? We have the birth of the new man. 
We have the formation of the body of Christ, right? The man, the body of Christ, the new body. Right after uh, the church, the church is in its... Uh, the book of Acts records the infancy of the church. You have this new creation that's never been around before. It was birthed, if you will, right after Calvary there. God, uh, it's the formation of the body of Christ, and it parallels, if you will, the formation of Adam there on day six of the creation. In John chapter 20, in the upper room, uh, Jesus breathed on the disciples, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That was God breathing into their nostrils, if you will, the breath of life, and these men became living souls because they were born again of the Holy Spirit is very similar to what God did with Adam on day six. By the way, Acts chapter two wasn't the breath of God birthing the church. If anything, the birth of the church was John chapter 20. I just want to throw that out there. All right. For people that argue as to when the church began and all this stuff. All right. And by the way, when you get born again, your soul is regenerated and born again, not the spirit. But that's another subject for another time. <laughs> so, man, Adam became a living soul. Amen. Day number five. Day number five, uh, we have the animals. Okay, what are animals and the beasts of the earth likened to in Scripture? As far as God's types go, if you've got all these animals, what are animals a type of in the Bible? Amen. Certain people, uh, specifically what kind of people? Kings. Kings, yes. Uh, I'm looking for uh, Gentiles. The Gentile nations are likened to the beasts of the earth, okay? And uh, various countries. Um, what significant thing happens, okay? So in the book of Acts, we're starting with the history of starting with the cross, and we're moving forward through time. We have the beginning of the book of Acts when the body of Christ is all beginning and things are getting going right after the cross. What happens as we go midway through the book of Acts? The gospel goes to the Gentiles, exactly. Uh, Paul is converted, and he becomes the apostle of the Gentiles. So what I'm looking for here is if there's any truth to this theory, I'm looking for number five, and it's going to have some, some connection with animals. We know animals are a type of Gentiles in the Scripture. And what do we have right after the formation of the body of Christ? And through the book of Acts, as history goes on, Paul's the apostle of the Gentiles. He goes and starts preaching to the Gentiles. The Jews are rejecting the gospel. The Gentiles are receiving it. And uh, in Acts 15, the apostles have to have a special counsel as to how to deal with this situation of Gentiles getting saved just like they did. Okay? Um, day number four. Day number four has to do with the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay? So this, so just so you follow, are you following my logic? We start at number seven, and we're going down, and I'm trying to find through history. So number four, I'm looking for, okay, sun and moon and the stars. What would that be as far as history goes? Because we're looking at the days of creation as far as history goes. So the sun and the moon and the stars, let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And you're on the right track, but uh, I might put that on the other side of the mountain. Because as far as the church goes, Israel got blown to pieces, you know, in 70 AD, and Israel hasn't been a nation for nearly 1,800 years. So after Acts... 15 and the and toward the end of the book of Acts you have the Gentiles being converted and what do we find toward the end of the book of Acts what significant thing starts to happen that you can remember from your from our studies of you know PBI or the book of Acts toward the end of the book of Acts what's what's going on anything off the top of your head he leaves the Jews yeah, the Jews are yeah, the Jews are kind of out. They're kind of left in the dust. The apostolic signs are starting to diminish, remember? Right? Why are the apostolic signs starting to diminish? Because signs are for the Jew. Signs are for the Jew, and also God is the purpose of those signs was to validate the words that the apostles were speaking. They come and say, "Hey, we're telling you something revolutionary, something you've never heard before," and to prove that, what, that we're not false prophets, we're going to give you a sign. Um, the signs started going away as God started turning his attention to the Gentiles, but also because more and more scripture started to become written during, those late, during the end of the book of Acts. You start having Paul writing some of his epistles right, to the churches. Uh, the Gospels are beginning to be recorded, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and more and more scripture is starting to be written 
toward, as you get towards that end of the book of Acts and afterwards. Now look at Genesis chapter 1. Look at the 1 verse 14. And God said, let there be light. Sun, moon, and stars, they divide the day from the night. Number two, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And number three, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. So around the time of the end of the book of Acts and beyond, you have the apostolic signs diminishing and being replaced by the scriptures, the written word of God. And unless I'm mistaken, the word of God helps me to divide the day from the night, if you will. I can recognize because of the scriptures what is right and what is wrong. Because of the scriptures, I can recognize the godly from the ungodly. I can recognize the saved from the lost because of the scriptures. That was the first purpose of the sun, moon, and stars, to divide the day from the night. And not based on my opinion, these are not how I de decipher things, but according to what the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, Ye are all the children of the day. Right? Or the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness, separating saved from lost. Day from night. You see that? All right. You know what else? Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that verse I just read. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So I'm going to put for day number 4, I'm going to put the uh, scriptures or the written word. Okay. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 5. So we see that the purpose of the sun, moon, and stars is to help divide the day from the night, which the scriptures do. Help me to be able to divide the saved from the lost and understand who's saved and who's not. Not based on what their outward performance is, but based on what the Bible says, if they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Even if a person's living like uh, the world, if that person has put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I can divide the day from the night. Because of this book. All right. First uh, Thessalonians chapter five, verse one, the Bible, the word of God, the scriptures also help me to be able to tell the time. Right. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. How do I know anything about the timing of Jesus's coming? Because of the scriptures. Literally, the scriptures are the only way that I can tell where I'm at in human history with any certainty. This book helps me tell the time, just like the sun and the moon. Now, we have watches and cell phones to help us tell the time. But in the old days, the way you tell the time is where the sun is in the sky. And you know, and you know what time of the month it is by where the moon is in the sky, right? It helps you tell the time. The Bible helps you tell the time. All right. Prophetically, if we didn't have the Bible, we would have zero idea where we're at in history, how far we've come and how much time is left. OK. And number three, the Bible has been God's instrument for giving light right upon the earth. OK, so I'm going to make a connection that the sun, moon and the stars have to do with the scriptures and the written word as far as history goes. Now, we know that the Bible was completed there in uh, 95 A.D. with the book of Revelation. And uh, as we move forward, uh, what do we have on day number three? Okay, we have the ground, we have the plants in particular, growth and fruitfulness. The light of God's word in history, as the word of God became published and became written and became put out and preached and recorded and copied and translated, what happens? there begins to be more and more fruitfulness, more and more souls saved, spiritual growth around the world that had not taken place up until that time. And um, just as it takes a time for a crop to grow after you plant a seed, so it took a long time for God's harvest to come in. From the time of the apostles all the way up to the publication of the King James Bible in 1611, God's servants have been sowing and after they got the scriptures, everything written down, they've been sowing, they've been planting, they've been watering, they've been toiling. And the great harvest comes in around 1700 to 1900 A.D. The great harvest of the Great Awakening. The great harvest of the great missions movements and the revivals. Those came because men sowed the seed for a thousand years before those guys showed up. 
just like a crop. If you think of a crop, you sow the seed and for the first you know, few months, you don't see anything. You see like little growth here and there. But by the end of harvest, you got more fruit than you know what to do with. And that's what you had there in 1700 to 1900 A.D. And now you say, well, where are we at now? Now we're in the gleanings, right? That's what happens when you're thinking of a harvest. This whole thing, God, God's types and everything He does are so miraculous and so amazing. He does, he does something and it's a type of a bunch of other things. It's amazing how God does that. A harvest and the planting of a harvest and the procession of a harvest is a type of the church age. What do you have? You have this great harvest of fruit and this reaping where people are getting saved left and right. You have uh, Billy Sunday and these guys preaching and thousands and tens of thousands of people are in an auditorium listening to the Word of God. People are getting saved left and right. And then what happens at the end of a harvest? After all the fruit has been gathered, things aren't growing anymore. You've got a few little things on the, left on the bushes. It's a time of gleaning, right? And the longer the time of gleaning goes, there's less and less fruit to be found. The bushes are pretty much picked over, and everyone acknowledges today that it is getting harder and harder to win a soul to the Lord. There are preachers that are in their 50s and 60s that have acknowledged the same thing. It's not just us whinging because it's so hard to lead someone to the Lord. It's not quite like that. There really is something going on where they remember the days where you'd preach and somebody would get saved every Sunday. You go out soul winning and people are getting saved. Uh, even Perry Demopoulos in the Ukraine, when he first went over there and the wall went down, he was leading souls to Christ left and right with a tape recorder that had a tape recording of somebody giving the gospel in their language. He'd put the little things on their ears and say, listen to this, and play it. And they'd, they'd, he'd say, you want to get saved? They only knew a few phrases, and they'd say, yes, we want to get saved. And they would get saved. It was just like there was just... It was a harvest. There was stuff just falling off the plants. They were so ripe, so freshly to be picked. But now, you ask them today in Ukraine, is it like that? No. The harvest has passed. The summer has ended. And, there's, and it's getting harder and harder to find some ripe fruit. All right? Uh, we're in the time of the gleanings today. And the sun is setting. The night is coming. The tribulation is coming. We're getting closer and closer to the tribulation. We're not going to be a part of it, but that's where we're at as far as the day goes. The sun is setting. And uh, the night is coming, and the dried up bushes are going to be burned soon. So I'm going to put num day number three as, uh, let's see, what did I, how did I write that down? I wonder if I, I'm going to put it down as uh, fruitfulness. Fruitfulness and uh, spiritual growth. Basically, that was day number three of the church age, just like day number three of creation. All right, day number two. What do we have with day number two of creation? The waters and the firmament. Now, like I said, we're getting toward the end of this harvest of day number three. And if you had to ask me, I think we're right here. We're in, we're, we've crossed into day number two. We've already seen the, uh, the uh, gleanings and the, la the lack of this harvest. The, great, the time of the Great Awakening, the Great Missions mo Movements, those are over. Uh, the time of the revivals, that stuff's over. America's not going to have a revival. I don't care what Billy Graham says. It's just not going to happen. God could do it. I realize that God is all-powerful, and if the hearts of the people turned, you could have something. But it's just knowing the hearts and the hardened hearts of the people, it's, there's, don't get your hopes up. All right? Day number two is the day of the firmament. That was the day in creation when the waters were divided. And I find this one really fascinating. And this is the thought where this whole Bible study came from. I believe that we are there in day number two. Day number two of creation was a time of great division, very great division. The earth was completely enveloped in water from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and God divided that water, okay? God divided the water. There was some water still around the earth, but the rest of the water was expanded and formed the frozen boundary of the universe called the deep. The waters that would have been, uh, the, the waters would have, you, if you were to look at Genesis or the second day of creation when God divided the waters from the waters, you would have waters on the outside of the universe and then outer space and then water, a little bit of water down around the earth. You would have essentially a sphere of water within another sphere of water, probably something to that effect. The water is uh, kind of like a sphere within a sphere. Now, listen, let's learn the truth. And if we got something not right, let's just 
trash it and find the right theory. I know it's normally been taught like this. You have the waters divided from the waters and the universe is a pyramid. And I do believe that there's a, something to that universe being like a garment, but you have waters from the waters. The problem that I've always had with this particular theory is this is a two dimensional drawing. How, what is out here? <laughs> you know, if this is true, what is this? If I shoot a rocket this way, where's it going to go? I mean, I could say I could shoot a rocket this way. It's going to hit the frozen deep up here. And you know, you've got heaven up here. And I agree there's, there's those types, but this is too oversimplistic. And also the idea that uh, the earth was originally like a cork bobbing on the water. Uh, I don't buy that either. There's, there's a lot of problems with that. And then it said, then the idea that in Genesis one, two, God submerged the earth. And, uh, now we've got, and then, uh, he divided the water from the water in this two dimensional model. It's, it's, there's a lot of problems with that. Even the scriptures used to justify that and prove that are not really talking about that. And so I'm frankly teaching, I teach in a little, a little bit different. Now that's just my opinion. If you want to believe this theory, that's fine. But the problem with the cork theory and the earth in the water and out of the water floating like a cork question, where'd the water come from? Oh, it's just there. It, the Bible gives a theory, gives a teaching as to where the water came from. But this theory is just, wh wh what's the boundaries of the water? Is it like, it, it, there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions. So I'm just going to say, Respectfully, I disagree with this theory. I, I believe what happened is, uh, I won't go into all the details of it, but essentially, uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the waters were created as a part, as a, had to do with Satan's fall. And that is essentially quarantined the earth, and quarantined sin within the universe, and separated the universe from sinless heaven. You had a sinful universe quarantined by water, separated from God, and then you had heaven out there, and then God expanded that water outward in a vacuum, which created the vacuum of space. So you've got water on the edge of the outer space, frozen, the deep, and then water, a little bit of water around the earth, and then there's some of that stuff that gets into the earth canopy theory and all that stuff, but we won't go into all that right now. That's all beside the point. What I want to draw your attention to is God divided the water from the water, and he didn't divide, in day number two, he didn't divide rock from water, he didn't divide dirt from water, he didn't divide fire from water, right? He divided water from water. Hmm. He divided something from itself. The two things that were now separated are, were both the same thing, right? Water from water. It's not like the water over here at this end of the universe was molecularly different from the water in the center of the universe, right? Where the earth was, right? Does everybody follow me? Okay, so you got water on the outside. If I could draw a 3D per image, it would be a sphere. And then you got the earth at the center of the universe with a little bit of water about around that. And God separated that thing out like that. And you got the firmament here. Okay, everybody following along. Um, this water and this water are both the same thing chemically, H2O. They're the same thing molecularly, and yet they're separated. Water separated from water. What do we find in Christianity after the time of the revivals, after the time of the missions movements, into the 1900s, into the Laodicean church age, where we're at right now, toward the end of the church age? What do we find? We find division, we find separation, and we find Christians separating from Christians. Christians separating from Christians. As Christians become more and more carnal and worldly and screwed up in their doctrine, God has to God has to divide some Christians from other Christians. God was the one that divided these waters, not Satan. Here in Genesis chapter 2 or the second day of Genesis, God has to divide Christians from other Christians. They're both Christians. Their spiritual makeup is the same. They both have the same holy spirit inside of them, but one set of waters is very much interested in the world, whereas the other set of waters is interested in heaven and the things of heaven and the God of heaven. And uh, God has to separate those two. God's the one dividing the waters because it's necessary, but it's not something that God is necessarily happy about. Remember, day number two of creation was the only day that God did not say that it was good. If it's not good, then it's what? It's probably bad. <laughs> it's not a good day. Water ought to be with water. Water ought to be united, and it ought to be one. And water that is uh, divided from water is not good, but unfortunately, sometimes it's necessary. 
And interestingly enough, you know what was between these waters there, <laughs> right? The Leviathan. What separated the water from the wire? The devil. The devil was getting in there, causing waters to be separated, causing Christians to separate from one another. It's Satan. Satan does that. It's not good. You know what I find in the early 1900s, after the New Bibles comes out, obviously, you have major denominational splits in the body of professing born-again Christians. I'm not talking about Mormons, and I'm not talking about JWs. I'm talking about professing born-again Christians. Many of those splits were over doctrine, which is good to draw lines of separation over. But it's not good that a vast number of Christians in those early 1900s started to fall and compromise and go into false doctrine. And then toward the mid-1900s, you have more splits in the Baptist conventions. And then you have the fundamentalists toward the latter 1900s uh, standing for the fundamentals of the faith. And they're separating from the more liberal Christians. Once again, we're dealing with saved people, but they're having to be separated. God is having to separate these people because they can't all stay together or else there's going to be total apostasy. So God has to separate the waters from the waters. And then you have in the last 20 years, you have the Bible believers separating from the fundamentalists. okay? Because the fundamentalists, they believe the right doctrines. The doctrines of the fundamentals, but they have the wrong Bible. And so the Bible believers now have to start separating. Because the devil's getting in there. And God has to pull the Bible believers out from the fundamentalists. All right, and finally, here we are in the year 2020. Professing Christians are splintered to pieces, and you have a very small group of Christians who still believe in the inspiration of the Scriptures, still believe in the preservation of the Scriptures, still believe in the authority of the Scriptures, and still believe the right doctrines within those Scriptures. Very small group. <laughs> very small group these days. And if the Lord tarries... You know what's going to happen to this little remnant of Bible believers? The only thing that can happen. The thing that happens in day number two. If the Lord tarries, I promise you, things are going to become more and more divided. The Bible believers are going to start becoming separated. And you know what? Uh, it's already happening. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. But even King James Bible-believing Christians are separating and cutting one another off over stupid things like, you believe in a seven-year tribulation, but I believe in a three-and-a-half-year tribulation. And so we can't have fellowship anymore. There's literally idiots out there that will cut off fellowship over how many years of you think the tribulation is. You say, what is that? That's the devil getting in there and God having to separate waters from waters. Because there's no humility. There's no meekness. There's no charity. There's no love for one another. It's this arrogant pride that thinks you're right and everybody else is wrong. And I can't fellowship with you unless you bow down to me and what I teach and what I believe and what my school taught me. That's pride. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I'm just saying, but you shouldn't care. I hope I probably lost. People are probably cutting fellowship off with me <laughs> because I teach this. <laughs> Well, amen. This sermon is for you. Uh, but uh, water dividing from water. You've got, we've got Christians that are cutting one another off and ending fellowship over what pastor you do or don't associate with. You have Christians, Bible believers. I'm not even talking about the apostate charismatics and all these guys. I'm talking about King James Bible believers that believe that this book is God's word and uh, is true from cover to cover, including the cover, separating over what pastor you affiliate with. Mr. Bible believer, could you find that for me in the Bible? Oh, well, the Bible says I can't have fellowship. But no, that's not even in the Bible, you Bible believer. Uh, you got Christians today, Bible believers, that are separating and dividing fellowship and cutting one another off, and I guess delivering people to Satan <laughs> over what year they graduated PBI. Oh, you graduated uh, post 19 something something or post 2000? Well, we're not going to support you as a missionary. Yeah, but I'm going to preach the gospel to a bunch of lost souls. I'm preaching the same gospel you're preaching. I'm doing all the same things you're doing. You're not going to support a missionary like, nope, you can't even come to our church. Because you're trained by someone we don't like. These pastors are idiots. 
I say that as much charity as I can. That's the reason why I say that is because that is so unbelievably unbiblical. And yet people are going around thinking that they have good sense with that kind of stuff. Uh, idiots is just my opinion. All right. <laughs> you can disagree with me over that. I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord, they're an idiot. But uh, I think that that's very, very foolish. Very, very foolish. Very, very foolish. There's no justification to break fellowship over those things. No biblical justification for it. I'm not going to, and I don't care how many, how old a pastor is, I'm not going to sit here and say that that's okay when that's not even biblical. This book's been, a lot, been around a lot longer than the, the well-known preachers of our day. I don't care what preacher there is on this planet in this day, this book's been along, around a lot longer than any preacher. I'm going to go with this book, not what some preacher says. That kind of stuff is not in the Bible. You don't find that stuff, and yet that's what people are doing all across this country these days. My peers that were trained in the same school I went to are cutting one another off over completely unbiblical things, and it doesn't even cross their mind that the Bible doesn't justify this, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's wicked. You say, what is that? That's Leviathan getting in between there. And God is having to separate these brethren from one another because there's some people giving, giving over to wickedness, man. And uh, you say, well, why? Why is all this happening? Well, it all fits in with day number two. We're in day number two. This is a day of separation. Now, I'm not going to go out of my way to separate myself from brethren, but don't worry, they'll separate themselves from you. <laughs> you don't have to separate yourself from people. I mean, the Bible gives a couple instances where you actually have to separate fellowship, but uh, don't worry. You, you, you live right, you think for yourself, and you uh, believe the book. Uh, the people will do the separating for you. You don't have to worry about that. God will handle that. But uh, I believe that God is having to divide the waters from the waters, and it's not good. And we're going to see, keep seeing more and more separation because we're in day number two at the end of the mountain. Until the Lord comes, I promise you, there will not be unity in the body of Christ, not even in the Bible believers. We're going to see more and more separation until we get to the ultimate separation. What's the ultimate separation? The rapture. Light from darkness. The, body, the, the day of the great division. The day where uh, the righteous go up and the unrighteous are left behind. And obviously when I say righteous and unrighteous, I'm not referring to somebody's performance of good works. If you're in Christ, if you're born again, if you're saved, you've got Christ's righteousness imputed to you. And the church is going to be taken out and that's going to be the separation of the righteous from the unrighteous. Everybody left behind are people that are unrighteous in God's eyes that have rejected the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Separation, the ultimate separation of light from darkness, the righteous from the unrighteous. And uh, furthermore, if we were to go in, in the time there, we could extend that day out into the millennium because also at the start of the millennium you have God separating the uh, sheep from the goats, right? More light from darkness. The sheep, the sheep are separated from the goats. And even at the end of the millennium you have another massive division of light from darkness, righteous from unrighteous, with the unrighteous assembling with Satan, right? At the end of the millennium and the righteous being with Jesus Christ. And then what happens? Well then you have a, uh, let's see, I need a different color for this. After the end of the millennium, we have, you know, an explosion. God destroys the earth, right? And then you have the great white throne, the heaven and the earth. And then you have out here, you have eternity and a new heaven and a new earth, right? Revelation chapter 20, 21. Okay. All right. So I find this very interesting. <laughs> I don't believe... Now, you can disagree with me. That's fine. But I don't believe I've really cherry-picked events from history to try and force my theory to fit. Uh, everything that I've given has been really major events that you could argue these are major things in history. And it, this pattern seems to follow as far as God's interest in the church over here. I'm going to say that most of this pattern has to do with the church, because that's what God's interested in in the New Testament is the church. Okay? Okay. Most of this has to do with the church, okay? And the major events that correspond to the history of the church, and I've matched them to the seven days of creation with the zenith being Calvary, the day of rest. Now, if that's true and accurate, 
that's not a testament to my brain or anything. That's a testament to God's brain. God put that pattern in place. But remember, I said at the beginning that there's a weird phenomena where in the Bible where God will do something and then repeat it backwards, like going up and down a mountain. So let's see if we can identify quickly some of the things that may fit the mountain going back down the other way. Okay, and uh, I'm going to go through these somewhat quickly. And uh, like I said, I'm going to give you my opinion on this and I'm going to leave it to you to decide whether it's right or not. But here's what I came up with. So we've got uh, the New Testament. What is God interested in in the Old Testament? Yeah, the, the Israel, for the most part. Israel, uh, Jews, you know, something to that effect, okay? So, day number seven, as at the end of the Old Testament, we have Calvary. That's the end of the Old Testament. If you go backwards, we've got day number six, and it has to do with the man. Adam, in Luke 3.38, is called the Son of God. Uh, Israel, in Exodus chapter 3, is called God's firstborn son, right? Nation of Israel. Israel is my firstborn. He tells Pharaoh, let my people go. So Israel, uh, day number six is Adam, the son of God, the man being formed. I'm going to make day number six the formation of the nation of Israel and the time of the nation of Israel. Okay. Going backwards, uh, day number five is once again the animals. And as I pointed out, the animals are a type of the Gentile nations. Okay. And... Uh, as we, uh, the first Gentile world power after Babel, okay, Babel, the entire earth was one. But after God separated the nations, the first Gentile world power, world dominion, was what? Who remembers that? Uh, uh, after Babel. Uh, it'd be the, it, it's probably confusing a little bit because we're going backwards, but it, the, Egypt. Egypt. Egypt is the first global world power thanks to Joseph after uh, the Nimrods fall in the Tower of Babel and the nations are separated. They all spread out. And then basically Egypt is that first world power. Animals, Gentiles, nation of Israel, nation of Egypt. So I'm going to contrast those two. Um, Egypt is essentially the antithesis of the nation of Israel. If Israel is God's son, which it is, then Egypt is Satan's son. One place in the Bible, the nation of Israel is likened to God's bride. If Israel is God's bride, then Satan's bride is going to be Egypt. Egypt is the antithesis. Uh, I make de day number five, the Gentile world power of Egypt there. All right, day number four, the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, what do you think of in an Old Testament context when you think of sun, moon, and stars, typo typologically speaking? Abraham and Sarah. Exactly. Uh, that, that dream of Joseph, uh, basically the patriarchs. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve sons. When Joseph saw his dream, I saw the sun and the moon and the twelve stars bowing down to me. And then later on, he sees his brethren bowing down to him. You have the patriarchs. The nation of Egypt as a world power, uh, the patriarchs were before that. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then they go down into Egypt, and they're uh, in the land of Egypt captive, and then they come out, and they become the nation of Israel, and then you have the history of Israel until Calvary, okay? All right, so we have the patriarchs with the sun, moon, and twelve star and, and stars. Day number three, plants and growth. Going backwards in history from Abraham, the next major significant period of Old Testament history was the repopulation of the earth after the flood. Repopulation. Okay. And overspreading of the earth in Genesis chapter 10 after the nations were divided. Right? After Noah gets out of the ark, God tells him, be fruitful and multiply. What do you have? Growth. Fruitfulness. Be fruitful, the plants and the fruit and all that stuff, be fruitful and multiply. And then in, after the Tower of Babel, you have this, the nations going everywhere and mankind and humanity starting to grow, especially in that fertile crescent of the Mediterranean, uh, uh, Mesopotamia. Okay. All right. And then uh, day number two, this one's easy. <laughs> day number two is a, had to do with water. What significant event before the repopulation and overspreading of the earth had to do with water. The flood. Noah's flood. Exactly. 
like I said, I'm not trying to cherry pick things necessarily, but I'm just looking at major uh, similarities. Uh, day number two, water, water, Noah's flood, that seems to fit. Okay, I'll go, we'll go with that. All right, uh, day number, uh, oh, by the way, Noah's flood was an end of all flesh, and that was not a good day. Noah's flood was not a good day. The earth had become corrupt, and once again, day number two, not a good day. God never said day number two was good. All right, day number one, light and darkness. Now, if you had to find something in the Bible prior to the flood, you only have five chapters to work with, but something prior to the flood, and you had to match light and darkness to it, okay, what would you go with? What would you guess? Based on what we have in Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 5, if you were to think of, well, what could light and darkness be related to that pertains to human history? Close, yeah. It'd be that uh, when Adam when Eve sinned, they went from darkness to light to darkness. Yeah, pretty much that's what I came up with. Uh, the Bible says in Genesis 1 4, and God saw the light that it was good. That implies that the darkness is bad or evil. What do we have in the beginning of human history? We have a tree of life that's good and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We have the introduction of sin into the universe, and <clears throat> man's eyes were, he was living in light, and then he went into darkness when he fell, light and darkness. So uh, I'm going to put <clears throat> the tree of life and uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Day number one, light and darkness. And what do you have right before that? Well, you just so happen to have <laughs> the destruction of the earth, Genesis 1-2, right? And then back here you have the, you have uh, eternity, and you have the creation of the original heaven and earth, right? All right? Now, let me just show you this one more time. Like I said, this is human, this is all of history. I've started with eternity past, ended in eternity future. This is Bible. The seven days of creation, and like I said, it's like into a mountain. You're going up, and then you repeat the thing going backwards, and then you end at where you began with a new heaven and a new earth, and the original heaven and earth. So we have eternity, Genesis 1-1, the creation of the heaven and the earth, the destruction of it in Genesis 1-2. Day number one has to do with light, the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, light and darkness. The waters, day two, Noah's flood. The uh, plants and fruitfulness, number three, the repopulation and overspreading of the earth after the flood. Sun, moon, and the stars, the patriarchs. The animals, the nation of Egypt becoming a, a major world empire, and that's the beginning uh, of the post Babylonian world empires. The post-Babel world empires is Egypt. That's uh, the, one of the heads of the dragon there. Uh, and then you have number six, the man, the creation of the man and the creation of the nation of Israel. Day number seven, a day of rest, right? God rested from his work. Jesus Christ on the cross bringing rest. Going back down the mountain, day number six, the man is going to be the body of Christ this time. Number five, the Gentiles is the focus on the Gentiles and turning away from Israel to the Gentiles. The animals coming in, into the ark. The animals coming into the ark, right? Like G the Gentiles coming into the boat, uh, coming into Jesus Christ. Number four, you have the scriptures beginning to be written and the written word and the recording of the scriptures and the translation of the scriptures and all those things happening. And as you go through that, you have start having fruitfulness. Spiritual growth starts out small and it's the the field is uh, watered with the blood of the martyrs and the preaching and the preachers. And then you have that harvest at the end and then the uh, gleaning after that. And then day number two, we have this stinking separation that we have to deal with this day and age that we're in where people are just dividing over the dumbest things. But that's where we're at. And then soon enough, we're going to have the rapture. And then you're going to have this the, the division of light from darkness, uh, the, the, the rapture, the millennium, the end of uh, the millennium destruction of the heaven and earth, new heaven, new earth, and eternity. You see that? It's, it's really interesting how it's laid. That, I didn't come up with all that. That was just in the Bible the whole time. And wouldn't it be just like God to pattern all of human history after the seven days of His creation? I mean, God's always doing stuff like that. <laughs> it's just amazing. And uh, I have another study very kind of like this where I, the same pattern repeats itself where it's a uh, it goes in one way and then reverses and goes another, and uh, that's another study for another time. 
pretty mind-blowing, but all throughout the Bible. God does this. This is a phenomenon that is in the Bible that God does, and it doesn't just happen one time. And uh, I hope that uh, this morning, that's all I've got for you this morning. I hope you'll walk away with a deeper love for God and His Word. I hope that uh, you recognize that God designed all this. You know, God wrote the Bible, and the King James Bible is the book of books. Amen. For the God of gods wrote the book of books, and I hope you'll study your Bible, I hope you read your Bible, I hope you love your Bible, and I hope you cling to your Bible, and I hope you obey your Bible. Let's pray. Father, I come before you this morning, and I thank you, God, for your word. I pray, God, that you'd bless it, and I pray your people would be edified by what was given this morning. Uh, Father, I believe you showed this to me, and like I said, I don't think I really cherry-picked anything or tried to cram something into things. I just was interested primarily in what you're doing today, where we're at in the year 2020, what is going on with all this chaos in the world and the chaos in the church and just everything falling to pieces. And Father, I believe you showed me that thing about the separation of the waters from the waters, and that's what you're doing. And you start with, you go with day two of creation, you work backwards and forwards, and Lord, I found, like, you showed me this whole pattern. And so, God, uh, here we are, the waters dividing from the waters, Christians separating from Christians, and it's stupid, and it's ridiculous, and it's infuriating sometimes, but it's, that's just the way it is. Lord, uh, you, that's what you're doing. Help us, Lord, to be on the right side of the waters, God. Help us to be on the side of the waters that you want us to be on. Help us, Lord, to stand for the truth, stand for righteousness. Help us, Lord, not to get caught up in cultish mentalities and cliques just because of uh, the, what the majority thinks or what the majority says or somebody's opinion. Help us to stand on what's right and what's true and what the Word of God says, regardless of what it costs us. Help us to be on the right side of the waters, Father. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.